Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Elite TV. We've got a Q&A lined up for you today and I'm ecstatic to say that I have got joining us for today's Q&A, Mr. Lee Dixon. Lee! Hey Mitchell, how are you? I'm good thanks mate, you? Yeah, good. Some of our younger fans watching this might be more aware of Lee as a pundit um, on Match of the Day, a um, bit of ITV, and now for NBC over in America. But for people of my generation and the generations before, we was lucky enough to know Lee as a player. So Lee played the majority of his career at Arsenal Football Club, becoming a, 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 an integral part of a defence that is still referred to today as one of the best defences that this country has ever seen. Let's just have a little quick look at some of the honours that he won. So amongst other trophies, um, Lee won four league titles, the famous night at Anfield in 89, which we will touch on in a bit. Um, 1991, losing only one game that season and lifting the title with also having two points deducted, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. And then just to top it off, two league and cup doubles so quite an impressive career um tell us how have you been and, and kind of how have you been coping with the situation over the last couple of months it's i've quite in, I say enjoyed I've, I've, I've quite liked the fact that everything's calmed down a little bit with everybody's lives and we've kind of had time to sit and look at stuff and assess what we how we rush about a million miles an hour on a daily basis and the, the hurry and scurry and missing opportunities to take in the really important things in life which is sharing stuff with your friends and family and being outside and looking at the trees and the birds and all that stuff we kind of know about but we don't really take into our into our mental state on a daily basis and i think that's certainly reset me a little bit in that respect and um, and also appreciated going back to football, appreciated the game a little bit more and what, what I'm missing in, in the fact that football's not on the TV, I don't get to go any games anymore, I'm not commentating and obviously the, the golf courses are open now so I'm, I'm a big guy and, uh, so I've been able to get out and, and have a bit of fresh air so it's I'm, I'm ready to go back though to be honest with you and I've got a couple of games up in Manchester and I'm actually looking forward to the feeling of going to a game and that, whether that's in the car or travelling. I think everybody who goes to, foot, to watch football, that excitement you get when you're on the tube going to a game or you're travelling in a car and you've got that, that buzz that you get before you watch a game. Um, I've missed that. Great. And, and just on that, as a fan, can you remember the first time that you walked into a proper football stadium as, as a young boy, can you remember what you saw and, and how you felt? Yeah, I was I was born in Manchester. I was a Man City supporter. My dad used to play for City in the in the fifties as a as a, a young goalkeeper. Um, so he, he played a couple of games um, on the on the hallow turf at Main Road. Um, so got, I was probably about I would say about seven or something like that when I first went to the game. And I don't think anybody ever forgets the, the first time, and it's not so much the game because there's things that happen before the game that, that imprint certainly on my mind more than anything. It's the first time that you actually see the pitch. When you walk up the steps from the, we were, I think we were standing in the north stand, or well, sitting in the north stand, and when you walk to the top of the steps and you just see that stage appear, I don't think any, anybody who watches their first game ever forgets that. And to, to back that up, a, a friend, a real good friend of mine, he's 95, he's American, he's a choreographer because my wife's a dancer, he, he does some work with my wife, still working at 95, an amazing man called Sir Robert Cohen. And he, I took him to a game the uh, season before last, I think it was Blackpool in the Cup at, at uh, the Emirates. And he been all around the world dancing, he'd been to see all, play, you know, been in the Royal Opera House, all the big stages in the world of being able to dance somewhere. And he'd never been to a football match. I took him when he was 93 years of age and he walked up those stairs and he's a bit, you know, a bit shaky on his feet and I was holding his arm and I got to the top of the stairs with him and he had that feeling at 93. It was, 
he saw the light. It was a night game. The lights were on. And he looked and he just went, wow. And he, his words were put tingled down my spine. He went, what a stage. And he saw it as the stage that we opened. And I never, never really looked at the pitch before and thought that myself, about it being a stage. Mm. But that's what exactly what it is. And it's just the, you know, the fact that that's back next Wednesday is, uh, is putting a smile on my face. Great, yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 I've got a smile on my face just, just hearing that because it, it really, it really is a moment. And um, you, you mentioned there that your, your dad was a goalkeeper. Um, so was, was football something that you was all around from, a, from a very young age? Was it, was it something that you really grew up with? We played in the street. We, we lived in, a, in Manchester, and the streets were very narrow. There was, um, you know, lamp posts. We used to use them as goals and put our, you know jumpers down and play in the street every single day after school um, and that's all I've ever known so the fact to actually go up and, and be a footballer was a, a dream come true and it you know and, and to end up playing at Arsenal was, uh, as you said was, was something that I could never have dreamt of when I was a kid because I always I always thought of playing um, at any level as an achievement but to get to get to the top with Arsenal was you know, I still pinch myself now, and I've, I've stopped playing 20 years ago. So, can you can you kind of remember the moment when you when you came to Highbury and, and when the deal was done and dusted? Can you, can you still take yourself back to that? And what was that like? Because I mean, that that's a massive move for any any player. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and it was a bit scared. I was scared to be honest with you because I was I, I played at Stoke for a season and a half, and they were in the second division or the Championship as it is now. And I was sort of found my level. I thought that's okay. I can play at that level. And then my manager Mick Mills at Stoke turned around to me and said, "We've accepted an offer from from Arsenal. So you're going to go to Arsenal." I was like, I was petrified. I'd, I'd only ever been to London once, and that was to watch an England game when I was at college uh, with a load of student mates of mine. And that was the only time I'd ever been to London. So, so the fact of going to London to live and and play football at at Arsenal was so scary to me, but I kind of didn't have much choice. You know, everybody said, you've got to go. And yeah. the little boy in me at the time would have much preferred to stay at Stoke and be nice and safe because I felt comfortable at Stoke. Going to Arsenal was scary. Um, but I never forget walking up the, the, um, the steps into the marble halls at Highbury with these beautiful, ornate Art Deco doors that you open to go in going up those steps and opening those doors and seeing the bust or the statue of Herbert Chapman looking at me with those two eyes. He was looking straight at me. And as soon as I walked in, I just went, wow. And I felt, I felt as if I was an Arsenal player from that moment. I hadn't even signed the contract then, but I just went, there's no way I'm leaving this place without signing because this is proper. Um, and it's, it was just an amazing feeling. And, uh, I was the proudest man ever when I signed that contract in George's office. Um, and you, th you think it's going to last forever. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things I would say to anybody who's playing that gets the opportunity to play the game at any level, whether you're playing for your Sunday team or you're playing um, you know, at semi-pro level or you're playing at good amateur level, or at any level at all, or you make it to an academy or everything. Look at every single game as if it's going to be your last one. And, and really, and your training sessions, every training session could feasibly be your last one. You might have an injury, you might never play again, you might get dropped, you know, anything can happen. So when you're in the moment of playing football, whatever level it is, whether you, you know, in a park with your mates, just treat that game as if it's going to be your last one and then you'll get the most out of it. And I think listening to, to what senior pros at the club, you know, David, the David O'Leary's, the people like John Luke, it's the people that I grew up with at Arsenal. Over a period of time, you start to listen to them when you've let the bravado go of thinking you're going to rule the world and it's only you and you're impregnable and you, you know, invincible. Yeah. Um, you start listening to these people and you kind of take bits and go, oh, really, right, it's never going to last, it's not going to last forever. Okay, then you end up turning into that guy who's telling the youngster, yeah. you know, like I am now. Yeah. I was when I was kind of, when Arsene came, I was 30 of age, so I was, I was, and I played till I was 38. So I, my last six years at Arsenal, I was, you know, telling the youngsters, I said, this is, this is the, this, 
moment now, this training session you're just about to do, this is all you've got. You haven't got tomorrow's game or Saturday's game. You've got this training session now. So take it, take the pain that you're going to be in doing the running, make it a, a, a happy place you go to and enjoy the fact that you're doing something that millions of people would, would want to do. The club at that time, Arsenal, was kind of renowned for having players that, that that took the game and the manager extremely, extremely seriously and giving 100% and <clears throat> carrying yourself well off the pitch and, and kind of the Arsenal, the Arsenal way. Yeah. So, so how was yeah. it? How was it after you signed the contract? How was it for you to then step into that changing room with with them kind of characters at that time? What was that like? Well, it was a massive education. Um, I think that the 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 the, 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 mo the moment you walk through the doors at, at the club, you are kind of it's drilled into you from everywhere, from the back room to the. Um, to the people who look after the the, the players' wives, um, everybody connected to to the club is taught and um, educated about what is expected of you. And we all we've all who heard it, who you are, what you are, and who you represent. Those are the that, that was kind of on day one. Dave Rocastle will come up to me and say those words, and I go, "What does that mean?" He goes, "Yeah, remember who you are, what you are, who you represent." that badge on your chest and it's like wow you know I, I played at Stoke which is a really famous old club nobody ever said that to me at Stoke remember about the badge at Stoke it was this thing was all about the cannon and the representing that um, first away game you know you go get fitted for your blazer with the cannon on it it was the most proud moment ever to get that blazer on I've still got it now upstairs you know, put that blazer on and then the tie, has to, you know, make sure your tie's done up, your button's done up, looking absolutely like George Graham was. George Graham was the epitome for me about what Arsenal was all about. He grew up with those those uh, um, ideals and and, uh, and I think it is an absolute pleasure. I took great pride in, as soon as a new player came into the, the club, you know, we're called Arsenal. I mean, no, we're called the Arsenal as you quite rightly pointed out. And that, that really resonated with me. I was like, and I still say that to this day, you know, I say, someone goes, oh, what are Arsenal? Do? I say, hang on a minute, you missed the word out. You know, it's the Arsenal. And I take great pleasure in, in you know, passing that information on. It's when the, the, when the bad stuff happens, that something goes wrong, that's where the, those kind of, that glue that binds everybody together, the reasons why you all do it for the same the same goal and the same uh, ideals bind you together in those times. And we had lots of those times where, you know, we talk about the, you know, the seasons where we had things go on in the season and everyone was criticising us and players were being under the, under the scrutiny of, of the media and all this stuff. That's, those are the times where you go with the Arsenal. We just, you know, just, just sort your tie out, pull your collar up look people in the eye and say, well, this is what we're all about. And it gets you through those times. And uh, it's a real powerful thing to have. And fortunately, I, I was there long enough to be able to pass it on to a few of the foreign lads who come into the, you know, the French lads came in. There was a few of them came in to begin with. Thierry will tell you, you ask him, he walked into that dressing room on his first day with a proper swagger about him. You know, he was coming in, so he was coming in to show us how good he was. Well, before you do that, we just need to educate you on what it's like to be an Arsenal player. We know you're a good player, but you've got to, you've got to tick these boxes before you're accepted. And he was shocked. You know, yeah, he, pulled, he had his socks pulled over his knees. You know, he'd, he'd come out to training, he'd be a bit, you know, I don't fancy it today, it's a bit cold. And we'd just kick lumps out of him and, you know, this is what we're doing today. And he, he, he couldn't understand why we were tackling him in training because he had a game three days later. We were like, we don't, that game doesn't exist to us. The only thing that we've got now is this training session, and, and I don't want you to win. So, I, and me, Martin Keogh, Nigel Winterburn, we're going to make sure that we make sure we do everything we can to stop you doing your job. Don't care that you're my friend and teammate. That doesn't matter. As soon as you get that yellow bib and I've got a green bib, you're the enemy. So, just get ready. So, and he's quite shocked by that. You. 
you as his teammate must have seen a gradual change in him where he then absolutely started to understand it and and I'm guessing that that then started to translate to his performances on the pitch, not just the way he carried himself, but how he played. Did, did you see that unfolding in front of your eyes? 100%, yeah, absolutely. You could, you could see the change in him as a player, as a person. And, it, and he, be, he went on to become Arsenal captain. If you ask, if you ask him about, um, if you ask him now about his role when he came back to the club, um, and before he left, it was completely transformed from that young boy who came into the dressing room. You do that anyway, but I think, you know, I hear him talk. If he was sitting here instead of me, he'd be saying the same thing as I was saying. And that, that to me, means that I've done my job because I've passed something on to him that he's now telling you about. And that's how it has to go around. I don't know whether the dressing room's like that anymore, or whether I think some of it's been lost. Mm. And I think, you know, Arteta hopefully will be in a position, he knows about that sort of stuff, that he can reintroduce those traditions, those ideals, as I've said, though those are really important small details that go to making the big picture, which is Arsenal, the Arsenal Football Club. Mm. How do, for young players, how do you kind of keep that mentality of continually wanting to improve and continually wanting to be able to play at one of the top clubs? You know, stay in, stay in the moment, work hard, work as hard as you possibly can. Every training session, just stay in that. Who are we playing at the weekend? Working towards that. Play the game. How did I play? Assess yourself. Don't start looking a month in, a month in, in, in advance and saying, oh, we've got this, so we're going to do that. We're gonna, your gunners and wunners never do anything. It's about doing it on the day. And that, and that is probably my biggest reason why I stayed. Um, at the top so long at Arsenal is because every day I really thought that somebody was going to go like this on my shoulder, tap me on the shoulder and go, right, okay, you've got to go now. You've had your, <laughs> over. You've had your week. Yeah, yeah. You've won a competition and you can stay at Arsenal for two weeks. Now it's over now. You've got to go back to Stoke. And I always thought that was coming. I was like, wow, I can't believe I'm here. Mm. Just keep working because then if I get on with my work, don't make a fuss, just stop. People will forget I'm here. And I think, I genuinely think, this is the, again, this is the insecure little boy in me. I genuinely think that's what happened. I kind of went, because I was playing right back, I could kind of just get on with my job. <laughs> don't tell anybody. I'm still here. And they were like, right. And I, even the fans, you know, the fans are coming. Uh, Highbury's 38,000 every week and they go the team sheet would go up and they go right Dave's seen and yeah oh the back four yeah there, that's okay <laughs> who else is playing oh, oh Dennis Burkamp's playing Patrick Vieira and oh brilliant oh I'm all going to win and then I kind of tip, tiptoed out onto the pitch and did my 90 minutes we'd win 3-0 clean sheet Never got a mention in, you know, in the in the newspaper articles. Fine, whatever. Dennis scored two. Right, he got a couple. And I just went about my business. And I was kind of, I think that honestly, think that that was a key part in it. Not necessarily that that's the truth, but it was my truth. It was kind of like, and before I, before I knew it, I was on the pitch. I can't remember the day, the game, but I, before I knew it, I signed a contract. And then the next minute, I'm on the pitch with Ken Fryer mm. giving me um, a silver cannon on the pitch with my 500th game. Congratulations, Lee Dixon, 500 games. I was like, I looked at Ken Fryer and I went, how did that happen? Where, where's it gone? I even had to look at, you know, and my last game against Everton was my 619th game. And I sat in the dressing room after the game and knew it was all over. I was retiring the next day. And I sat there and everyone was saying congratulations and Tony Adams was retiring as well. And we sit and I looked at him and I went, wow, that was a, that was a ride, wasn't it? And he went, I can't believe it's over. And it goes like that. But hard work and perseverance and staying in the moment was probably the key to it. Um, and... There's a lot said about kind of this idea of a winning mentality at, at, at a top club. And I, and I think you've kind of said that you was disappointed that there was some years where you didn't 
challenge for the title, even though you, you'd won yeah. titles and you went on to win more titles. And I think that's kind of a must-win kind of attitude. And I think that that's important at, at, at kind of top-level football. And I think there was a season about, I think it was the 97-98 season, where Arsenal kind of had a bit of a wobble before Christmas. There was a game against yeah. Blackburn. Um, yeah. I had I had a season ticket that season. I was down in the West Lower up at Highbury and and I remember that game and I think it was 3-1, three, three I think we lost and there was this inquiry after. And I mean, that's kind of part of being a, a, an adult, being able to look across at teammates and ask very difficult questions. And yeah. I think we hear that Arsenal back then was a, was a club that wasn't afraid to demand stuff and wasn't afraid. And it was kind of a bit like what you were saying about passing on the... the the kind of mantle to, to players coming in. Mm -hmm. how, how does meetings like that work? And, and can you remember that and, and, and how that, because you then went on to, I think, a 12, 13 yeah. game win streak from what I remember. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of rubbish talked about um, team spirit. And I hear people talking about it going, oh, they, they've got really good team spirit. And I go, so what's team spirit to you then? And I ask, I'll ask him, so what does it, what is it, what does that mean? Because we, we all say stuff about anything and we don't, sometimes we say we've heard and go, oh, they, that team's got great team spirit because they see them, you know, they see them on the pitch before the game doing a big huddle on the halfway line. They're all sort of like this and they'll go, oh, they've run together, got great team spirit. This is totally my opinion. So, what team, for me, what team spirit is, is the ability for a group of players to be able to air differences and their grievances, what's going right, what's going wrong, within the group and the group taking those bits of information on board, whether it's being levelled at you or that you're not doing your job or you're letting somebody down or whatever it is, Taking it in the way, in taking it on board, and then using that information to get a better performance out yourself or the rest of the players or one other player in the team. So it's the ability to take criticism from somebody who's standing there who's saying to you, "You're not doing your job. I think you should do this." Team spirit is when you've got a group of players that can do that, can take that on board and go, "Do you know what? You might be right. You might you might not necessarily agree with him." You go, well, whatever, and then actually during the game, you something happens and you go, God, he's right, I, sh I should have got tighter, I'm not tight enough to Ryan Giggs. You know, something. And so the, the team becomes a better team because of something that's been said in a meeting or, a, or a, a, an instruction. That's team spirit. Now, you don't have to like, you don't have to like the person who's saying it. Everybody thinks team spirit's high five, we're a great bunch, you go out for a beer after the game, you go out with our wives and go to a restaurant and have food together because we all get on great. The best teams get on to a certain extent, but you don't have to like the player. Roy King didn't like anybody. You know, he, he doesn't even like his he doesn't even like his own family. You know, he's like, I'm taking it to the extreme, but and he he demands things from his players and his teammates. And he upsets people. And if you don't like it, he's not interested in you. He wants to make you a better player and make the team better. That meeting we had that you're talking about was exactly that. There was a few things said in that meeting that that hurt. And a few home truths that different departments of the team were accusing others of not doing this. You're not doing that. We're not doing this. We, we'll accept that we could have been tighter. We this, that and the other. But we need a bit of help. And, and it was a few home truths were said that we, we kind of took the eye off the ball a little bit and we reacted in the way that made the team better. That's what team spirit's all about. Great. And, and I mean, you talk about Roy Keane and, 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 and kind of teams that was, that was there in the 90s. Because um, we, we, we try and talk to a lot of the, the, the players at NCF Elites kind of a lot about mentality. Because, you know, you can have all the, the technical ability in the world and they've got great coaches down there that are working on their, on their <clears throat> technique day in, day out. But we try and kind of open the eyes of, of, of the kids to maybe top-level football and the mentality you have to have. So um, when you came through, um, when you got signed for Arsenal, obviously, 
Liverpool was kind of the, the main team at that time and probably your fiercest rivals, yeah. particularly after 89, which I do want to talk to you about in a bit. Um, but then Man United kind of came on strong and, and there was about six, seven years where there was a real, real rivalry between the two clubs, mm. um, and which as fans we loved. But there was also kind of a respect there, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, because you'd have, both teams were kind of similar in, in mentality and that desire to win. As a player, how do you kind of, how do you have the respect for a team in your mind, but also the, the kind of the must, must win and the go into battle mentality when you walk out, out of that tunnel? And how was it part of being of that, that, that strong rivalry for so many years? That mentality is huge absolutely huge and it's really difficult to quantify it you can look at the numbers on a fitness scale and go he's not fit he needs to do more runs he needs to do this and he's because there's data that goes like that you try and measure it mentality you can, it's very difficult to go is he mentally strong well yeah he looks it and then all of a sudden he'll let you down and you go i'm not sure now so it's, it's very difficult mm. And how did you get into that zone? I mean, I mean, you're saying that you had to be in that zone for every single game. When when you came up against uh, Man United, uh, mid to, to late nineties, did you did you feel yourself go up another gear? Did you did the pressure was it was it difficult to deal with? Yeah, you do you do feel yourself go up because you know who you play is equally as focused. So. Fixtures have come out and we play. I'd look at the fixtures and I'd go, right, we've got Man United's game six. I'm looking, I'm going, they're equally as fit, mentally as strong, if not stronger in some departments, whatever. They've got Ryan Giggs. So straight away I'm going, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look at the fixture list and go, I need to get up. I do need to be at my best to get to, to be at the very, very top of being like, if you played Man United every week, in 38 games, you would like, oh, Christmas time, you'd be like, ah, oh, I need a rest. I can't, I'm done. Because your brain is like, <laughs> Let's go back to, to possibly one of the biggest games um, from a fan's point of view, but, but you might tell me different. So, so 1989, um, Liverpool. No, no, no. It is the most important game. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, people are saying now Man City's end to the season a few years back competes, but for me, I'm obviously biased as an Arsenal fan, but no chance because you, you, you've got the two teams in that game. The, the title is going to be won by one of them two teams there present on that evening. Yeah. It doesn't matter what happens yeah. elsewhere, it's a head-to-head. Correct. Um, most people will know, but for, for those that don't know, um, Arsenal had to go away to Anfield, which was probably the most intimidating place to go to from a footballing and an atmosphere point of view, um, and win 2-0. Yeah. Easy job, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was just, I don't know what all the fuss is about. It just, it just <laughs> went and did the job, you know? No, I mean, let, me just, let me just point out exactly what you just said, that the Aguero moment, being a City fan, was incredible. And I was watching the game, 2-1 down, had a corner, had to win the game, and they won two, two, scored two goals in next to nothing. And it was amazing. But it, people who say that that is anything like what we did in 89 are literally need to be looked at because it's not, that's not right. And you need to get it into context. Just because it's pre-Premier League doesn't mean to say it didn't happen mm. because people now obviously look at the Premier League and the coverage from Sky is exceptional but you know the youngsters out there who are, who, are, um, who, you, who you you deal with on a regular basis some of them don't even know that football existed before mm. the Premier League um, and we have to absolutely point out so you should watch 89 the documentary that I helped make so that will get them tuned into the education of it but yeah it, it will it will never happen again and you can virtually say it will never happen again the mm. circumstances of that season were extraordinary and the finish and the climax and the tension at the end and the drama will never be never happen again you hear kind of since then um in in kind of snippets with players or george graham that kind of there was a plan going up there and 
you had a game plan and you had to stick to it. And it's, it was kind of made like that you guys always believed that it was possible. Now, if you're an elite sportsman, you're always going to believe that something is possible to do. But, I mean, the odds didn't look great. Can you, can you cast yourself back to that day and, and, and how you was kind of approaching the game mentally and the way up there and how you felt? Yeah, we, we were pretty relaxed, to be honest with you. We'd, we should have won the league um, a couple of weeks before. We had Derby at home and, and Wimbledon at home in the last two home games. We win those two in the, in the league's hours. And Liverpool were on this amazing run of like, games on the trot or something. They were hunting us down, but it was in our own hands and we fluffed our lines. We got beat at home to Derby and drew to Wimbledon 2-2 meant that Liverpool had a game in hand. They played that game against West Ham and beat them 5-0, which made it virtually impossible for us to go to Anfield and have to win by two clear goals. So the pressure was almost off because everybody thought, well, they've blown it. And to be honest with you, at the time, I thought we'd blown it. I said to the lads, well, we've got no chance of beating Liverpool. Um, we kind of played well against them that season. Beaten, you know, We had two really good games against them in the League Cup and also the league and it was kind of like yeah but we've got beaten 2-0 and they're you know they they don't lose at Anfield let alone get beat by two goals so we were quite relaxed George made a point of taking us up on the day as opposed to going up the night before and staying in a hotel he wanted us to be in pretty pretty much straight in do the game and get out that was his mentality of you know almost like stealing it off him um, and the, the one thing that I wasn't expecting was virtually every single director that was at the club and the director's mates and their mates were on the team bus on the way to Anfield. And I remember getting on the bus before the, after training and uh, we were travelling up at late morning and uh, we always had a, a card school at the back of the bus for like me, Steve Ball, John Luke Hitch. Tony Adams got on the coach and there was two directors sitting in my seats. And I was like, what are you doing? And they were like, oh, there's nowhere to sit. So we can't sit there. I've sat there. That's my seat. And they were like, and they were like, oh, where are we going to sit? So what are you going to do? Are you playing tonight then? Are you, are you get on my seat. It was like, and there was people on that bus I'd never even seen before. You know, Paul, G Paul John, John I will tell you, I mean, he was on the bus somewhere, I'm pretty sure of it. But it was, it was, honestly, it was unbelievable how many people we crammed on that bus. And George was really brilliant at bringing it down a little bit and saying, look, just don't just treat it as another game, it's fine. There's no hype to it as far as the players were concerned. And I think probably deep down, you know, our, I think we were looking at, if you're looking at our hearts believed, but our heads were kind of like, wow, I've got to beat Liverpool 2-0. And he, the game plan was always the key to it. You know, he, he didn't want us to go out and try and score. We were like, well, we've got to score two. He said, yeah, but you don't want to score too early. You don't want to, you know, keep the crowd quiet. Don't let them get, you know, keep a clean sheet. Half time, nil nil is a great result. And we were like, is it? <laughs> it got be one nil up at least. And, and he convinced all the players that that was the way. He said, score one early in the second half, which we did. And then he said, then we start to plough pressure on and the crowd will get nervous because they'll realise one more goal and it's ours. Mm. And then Michael missed that, that chance in the 56th minute or whatever it was. And he was like, oh, that's it. That was the chance. Mm. No, it was later than that, 70-something. And he was kind of like, that was the moment we just thought, oh, really, have we just fluffed it in the last, you know, in the last 20 minutes? And then... History will suggest that he got another chance around the corner, and uh, he wasn't going to fluff his lines this time. What a, you know, the, the, and the ending was just surreal. I, get, I can't talk about it now. I've watched '89, the documentary. I must have watched it 25 times, 30 times, because when we released the documentary a couple of years ago, there was a lot of screenings at the cinemas, mm. and I used to go along as the <clears throat> the spokesman and uh, we turned the lights down and people had, had paid to, to have a private screening and there'd be like 40 gunners all sitting there with a popcorn and then 
you turn the lights on and I'd be on stage standing there. They'd all go, oh, what's that? And then they'd ask me a load of questions and I'd say, right, I'm going to sit down and watch it with you. And I'd sit down in the cinema and watch it again. And so I, I, 30 times I must have seen it. And every time I see the goal, every time I see Michael going through, I still think how it's going to just kick the ball away in the last minute. Yeah. And it's that, it's that, that close. Yeah. And uh, yeah. can you remember the moment the ball went in and, and, and kind of had... Is that still with you, that, that memory? Because you must have realised mm. that that's it now. And that that's it. All you've got to do is see out 30 seconds, something like that, and, and that's it. Yeah. I was about on the halfway line because I'd played the ball to, to smudge and then I was kind of just jogging up, trying to see whether Michael was through or not. And I could, couldn't quite see his players in the way. And I kind of looked and then I saw him flip the ball over Grobelart and I knew he'd gone in. And I literally just started crying on the pitch. I didn't know what to do. There was nobody near me. John Lukic was still in the goal. All the lads had kind of run up the other end of the pitch. And it was, I, was, I didn't have anyone to celebrate with. And I was just emotionally completely drained. And the tears were flooding down my eyes. And then I just realised that they were going to kick off again. And I, I couldn't see out of my eyes. I was trying to get the tears out of my eyes. I thought if they come down my side, I'm in big trouble here. And uh, luckily they didn't. They went down the other way. And then, as you said, 30 seconds later, they blew the whistle and uh, all, all hell broke, broke loose then. It was just a, an incredible feeling that first my first full season at Arsenal and we'd, uh, you know, we'd won the league against them. You know, and then were the, the, the probably the most successful um, English club in, in English football for many, many years and we're just a relentless winning machine and we beat beaten them. And then a few years later you, you went and played up against um, Palmer. Hmm. Um, not the, quite the same circumstances but against a very, very good team um, where yeah. most people would have probably said they were the favourites. They had a lot of, a lot of good players. Um, and again, you kind of went there and, and in your words, it was almost like you stole a 1-0. I'm, I'm not saying that Arsenal was outplayed. They just kind of seemed to have a yeah, game plan. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to say that. But you had, you had a game plan and you stuck to it and you looked kind of, of, of in control of the situation and, and, and what was happening. And, and I mean, that must have been a, an amazing night. Yeah, it, it was because... The one thing we had going for us that night, we were massive underdogs. You know, they, they, they were a brilliant team, Palmer. They were setting Serie A alight. They, were, they had Broly and they had um, Zola, Asprilla. They had a brilliant football team. Their, their front three was sensational. Mm. It would be tough. But the one thing we had in our advantage, which was massive, and I think sometimes it's underrated, the power of what we had that night was we had probably seven eight, seven eighths of the of the crowd, if not more. It was just wall to wall Arsenal, red and white everywhere. There was a tiny little thing behind the goal where all the Palmer fans were and we thought, you know, is that it? We literally had the whole stadium. It was like playing at a home game and that they were super. They realised they were a good side. They got a few chances in the first half, back four was really stretched. And then we second half, it was an onslaught. It was like the, you know, it was like the Alamo. We were just behind, getting pelters from left, right, centre. Uh, the lads were throwing their bodies in the way. Balls were. Down. I mean, I gave a penalty away in the second half. How I didn't give that, I'll never know. You know, it was. I think Tony gave one away as well. It was, it was just last gasp tackles, trying to keep the ball out of there. Dave Seaman made a few saves. It was just, just a brilliant night. And and you mentioned the fans there. I mean, as it kind of as a young like when you're a fan growing up um watching football and then and then you're a the player then what's the relationship like with the fans and and does that play it you know at Anfield or or against Palmer when you see the scenes in the stands does that kind of impact you knowing that you've kind of yeah, your part in that you're doing it you know you're doing it for yourself because you want to win yourself, but you aren't doing it for the fans the, the game is you know we're going to find out out next week when we start the Premier League again. The game is nothing without supporters. You know, we're going to go through this period now with no fans and that's because we have to and we have to respect that. And, but it will be weird. It'll be strange. And the whole point of, of playing in those 
big games and, and celebrating is to celebrate with the fans. I've always had a really good connection with with all the supporters I've played with at all my clubs. I've made a point of, you know, going to Shakhtar the next and playing in the, on a Wednesday night or Tuesday night in the Champions League and getting beat over there and pouring down rain and you know, I'm the first, I was always the first one over at the end of the game to say, do you know what, thank you for travelling all this way. I mean, we travel first class, we're in a lovely hotel, we're going on a private plane, we're da -da 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 -da, eating lovely food. And these guys and girls are, are travelling all over Europe, you know, on, on, on connecting flights all over different countries to get there by bus, any, any way they can do. And then at the end of the game, the least we can do as players is walk 15 yards from where you're playing and go we've got to be yes I was rubbish yes you are quite rightly can boo me if you want but I'm still going to say thank you I've been booed when I've gone over to say you know very rarely but they've been booing the team because we've had a really bad result and I've gone I don't care the lads are going I'm not going over there or something you know you're like look tell you what I don't care what they're, they're right they're right to, to say what they think about my performance but I, I need to show them that I appreciate that you've travelled all this way. So I always made a point of that and, I, and that relationship in, in the bad times as well, when those moments, you, you, you gain a, a trust from them that you're giving everything you can and then when you celebrate with them, when you've won something, it, it means that much more. Mm. Yeah, great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about when Arsene Wenger came to the club. So, I mean, you'd been established at the club for, for quite a few years by the time that he came. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, we've heard quite a lot about his, his, the way his methods were and how he changed kind of the, the, the mentality of the club in regards to nutrition, fitness, stretching and that. But if you'd been at a club for so long and you was, I think you was 31 when Wenger 32. came. 32 when Wenger yeah. came. And, and a lot of the back four back five would have been similar ages. How difficult is it yeah. as a player to take on new ideas when you haven't seen if they will work or yet and you're so <clears throat> and you think, I've been doing a good job so far, why do I need to change? How, how difficult was that for the Arsenal dressing room to take him on? Well, I think he, I think Arsene was, um, I don't know if luck is the right word, but I think he, he came to the club at a perfect time for the senior players like myself. So we uh, we kind of got a, a group of players who are you, you probably look and go come on come into the in the autumn of their careers so let's put it that way. But I think that was a bonus for him because we were good pros. We all trained hard. He, we're all willing to go because he said the first virtually the first thing he said to I you know if you take on these methods do this stretch you need this food do this do that you know you could play you could go on and play you know. A long time because you get him a few more years out of you, and I was like, right, I'm in. Arsene said you can play to the you know a few more years into your mid thirties because I'll give you the the uh, the ability to look after your body, you, the ability to understand your body. And so I was like, right, I've got I know the tactics, and he's now telling me I can be stretched, you know, I can get another three or four years out of my body. I'm in. So yeah. that that was the good thing. We all bought into it instantly, not 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 necessarily knowing that he was going to be successful, just believing in me. Yeah, he was a very believable character and very very um, very deliberate in the way he spoke to you. You know, he could talk about anything. You know, he could talk about double glazing, and he would say it in a way that you go, "He knows about double glazing." Whether he did or not, you know, he just got that ability to to be very. He's a very intelligent guy, and so I believed him, and I said, right, I'm in. And he, you know, he, he took on board the back four and went, you know, I'm happy to give you a bit more of a chance. I was going to get rid of you. He told, told me that after six months. He said, I was going to phase you all out, get a new back four. And then I realised I didn't need to, and I could build from, from you upwards. And uh, thankfully, that meant I played another six years, which were the, best, the most enjoyable six years of my Arsenal career. I learned more under George as a as a coach, mm. but the, the 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 enjoyment level of going out and being free, and not having the restrictions that George put on me, um, was it was those six years. Was, I mean, how can you not have fun playing with Thierry Henry, Dennis Bergkamp, 
Mark Overmars, Robert Perez. I mean, uh, it's just Patrick Vieira. It's just like, it's easy. I mean, no disrespect. I've never seen you play football, but you could have played right back in that yeah. era. It's just, <laughs> just easy. Well, I was lucky enough to watch so many games um, in, in the mid to, to late 90s, kind of live, and, and I was close to the pitch. Um, and kind of it, what, what struck me at that time and what kind of sticks with me was not only just the, the kind of technical ability, but the, the intensity of everything. Mm. Um, I was like by the halfway line. So most of the game I'd have in 98, I'm talking Vieira and Petit just in front of me. Yeah, the staff. Yeah. Depending on what way we was playing, I'd have you bombing down one side, and then Nigel in in the second yeah. half, and um, kind of just that the aggression and the men and the kind of intensity of everything. It, as a fan, it it was beautiful to watch that that kind of combined with you know some beautiful passing football, some great counter attacking football. When when you was playing mm-hmm. in that side, did you know at the time that you know we're playing some special football? We're playing some really really good football. Yeah, I did because I didn't have to do anything. So that's not that's normally a sign for for a slightly different now because the position of of what's required of left back is slightly different now. Um, but in those days, you know, I say it's not that long ago, but in in, in certainly ninety eight, the game was so easy for me to be able to you know get the ball off whoever. Dave rolled it out to me and I got the ball and turned. And I'd look, I'd look at the pitch and I'd go, oh, I've got Dennis, I've got Nicholas Anelka making a run. I've got uh, Ray Parler outside me. I've got Patrick Vieira in there or I can chip one to, to Manu Petit. Or, I mean, if I gave the ball away in 98, it was a, it was a sin because there were so many options. Um, so it was, it was easy and it, and it was the best. I think... I always say, and I'm slightly biased because I wasn't an invincible. I retired in 2002, 2004 invincibles. I always say this. If you take the 98 side and you take the 2004 side and we played each other 10 times with no draws, so draws don't count, we would beat the 2004 team 6-4. That was, that was what happened. I think the 98 side was a better team than the... 2014. They'll disagree, and they'll because they were undefeated and invincible. And quite rightly, they're very proud of that. But I think the '98 side was was absolutely sensational. It got its back four at its peak. Got the best goalkeeper in Europe. It had an unplayable Nicholas and Elka. Nobody knew him. Nobody knew what he was about. He ripped teams to pieces. Man Petit, Patrick Vieira. Mark Obermar, it was just off the charts. Dennis Bergkamp, it, it was just off the charts good. It was a pleasure to play in it, I can tell you that. And you must have been quite <laughs> pleased for, for, for Wenger as well, because, I mean, when he came along, nobody really knew who he was. That was his first full yeah. season, I believe, the 97-98 season. Yeah. Um, we didn't have many foreign managers in the game at that time. Um, and, and then I suppose you, you, you kind of... You, you, you was probably fully bought into his ideas by then and was like, right, I kind of mm-hmm. trust this guy the same way that he trusted you guys. And then, as you yeah. say, you had, you had an enjoyable few few years. So was, was that your favourite season of the kind of second half of your Arsenal career? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, because I was playing every week, you know, 2002, we won the double and it was my last season and I enjoyed that season. But I, I played 10, 11, 12 games that season from the start, I was on the bench, Lauren had taken over, uh, quite rightly so, I was kind of 38 and I was hanging on a little bit. Um, so that season was enjoyable, but 98, because I was, I was playing every game, I was still the number one right back, I was still fit, I was still flying, I, I felt at the peak of my powers then, I was 34 and I could have, I, I felt as if I could play till I was 50. Because I had this, I had this working so well. I, I knew the game. I could, I could, I could literally close my eyes while I was playing, and I could go. You could say the ball. They've got the ball, and it's just ten yards over the halfway line in the right hand side. So the opposite side to me. So their right hand side. So 
they've got the ball there. To, so spot the ball, spot the players, tell me where all your players are. Literally close my eyes and they go, right, Martin Keogh's 15 yards inside of me and about three yards behind. And I could tell you where every single player should be. Sometimes they weren't. But it, it was, the game became so easy for me to work out pattern of play, where, what happened. If you've played 619 games for a team that played it together, you know, a long time, you can, you can, there's only so many places the ball can be. So if it's there, we should all be here. If it's there, then we should be here. Mm. So the patterns of play start to become imprinted on your brain. So you're not learning it anymore. You kind of know it. You go, right, this should happen now. Obviously, you've got individual skill sets on the players on the ball. You know, John, try and work out what Giggs is going to do because he'll do something different every time. But he's, he's in an area of the pitch with the ball and he's got space. So what's go through the manual, what happens next? So you go, right, Giggsy with space, running at you, call for help. Like, hey, someone, hey, come on, help. You know, that's, didn't quite get there quick enough in the semi-final really, when I was calling for help, but you get the picture. The difficult thing is, as your powers of, of, uh, of knowing the game go up, your physical ability starts to come down and then there's a crossover point that's, probably about that big that's the golden that when they talk about the purple patch when they talk about players at their peak mm. that's that little square box where your physical powers and your mental uh, understanding of the game cross over and it doesn't last very long you know it's a couple of years <laughs> where did that go and then you start boom, then, you, then then people start saying yeah his legs have gone because <laughs> his brain his brain's not making up for the fact that he can't run anymore yeah Wicked. And and how and, and at the end of that season, it had been a while since you'd lifted a trophy. Um, how was it um, kind of in 98, Everton at home, Tony Adams scoring the cultured uh, screamer right at the end of the game with his left peg? Was that, was that a big moment? Yeah, I mean, if, if ever you're going to epitomise a season, um, then you, you smash Everton and Tony Adams scores a left foot volley from a through ball from Steve Bold, flicked over the top and then scores a goal like that. I mean, that just sums, summed Arsene up. It summed Highbury up. It summed Tony Adams up. And it summed the 98 team up. Everything, everything about that team was in that moment. Because I remember when he scored and I was on the right back position looking over. I remember when he scored and looking at going, what I've, I've just seen, I've just seen Tony Adams go on a through ball and smash it in with his left foot. And then I looked at the the um, the North Bank and the tier was like bouncing with people jumping up. And I was look, I just I sucked it all in. I can see it now. And I look, I look round and I went, "Wow, this is what this is what this season is all about." It, it, everything was happening all in that one moment, and uh, it was no, unforgettable. And I, yeah, I think the, the, the expression on Tony's face after the goal went went in and the kind of sun, sunshine was just coming right down on him and fans that was there will we'll remember forever and and some of the parties that went on in the streets after the game all the way up to the parade really it was a it, it was a great end to a season um so you spoke a bit about when you've <coughs> and kind of the last season you could start to feel the pressure easing off a little bit where you maybe wasn't playing as much and also, you know, you'd already achieved so much. How did you then go from, from finishing football to getting into punditry? Well, I'd done a, I was doing a little bit for BBC because I wasn't playing as much that season. I had a couple of injuries as well. So when I was injured, I'd do football focus on a Saturday for BBC. And, and in those days, there wasn't a lot of players doing that sort of stuff. It was something I enjoyed. I enjoyed the, the process of being able to analyse and talk about my experiences and, and look at something and say, well, I think this, not, not that I know best, just this is my experience. And I, I'm a, a big believer in, in not trying to talk people down and talk down to people about, about football. This is right. This is, there's, no, there's no black and white with it. It's, it's an opinion-based game. There's, 
I think he should have done this because of my experience, that's what I would have done. And so you have to be very careful as a, as a and that's why I got into it because I think I'm, I seem to be able to have the ability to do that, to explain it in a more compassionate way. It's not, it's not just black and white criticism. Some pundits do it the other way. They just criticise and then say good things and bad things, good things, bad things, <clears throat> which is fine. Um, but I just started doing a bit more of it. And then when I stopped playing, they asked me back because I could string a sentence together because, you know, if you, could, if you could say a sentence without stuttering or saying a swear word that you were in, you were back in the next week. So um, fortunately, I, and I kind of give it a year and I thought, see if I miss it a lot and if I miss the game a lot I'll, I'll do my badges I've done one of them I'll do my other badges and I'll go into coaching and, mm. and to be honest with you I just I really fell in a niche kind of part of, of the game that I enjoyed and, uh, and I've been doing it since you know for 18 years now it's like it's, it's what I do and I, and I love it it's brilliant and, and how do you feel um, commentating or kind of analysing Arsenal matches and how, I mean, there's quite a lot of positivity coming about with Arteta come in. He, he's had a tricky start to come in mark partway through a season and then with everything locked down to then have that interrupted. Um, and it takes time for a new manager um, to, to kind of settle in and put their imprint on it. And I think Arsenal was, was going through a bit of a troubled time in, in, in the two or three years before that. Um, when you when you watched Arsenal this season, and from what you know about Arteta, like how how do you see them at the moment? Uh, Arteta knows the club. He's 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 got the Arsenal feeling, I think. And uh, but it's going to take time. It doesn't matter how good a coach you are, you're only as good as the players you've got. And I'm being ultra critical, or no, let's say ultra critical. I'm being honest when I say that but the players that they've got now are not good enough. Um, in general, as a squad. Uh, there's obviously some very talented players there, and he and I think he knows that. And it's just a matter of now with the pandemic, how how the restructuring of the club and recruitment go is is going to happen. I don't know. I don't think he knows. So it's, the, the fans have got to be patient. It's going to take time, um, but I think there's been signs there that he's, he's getting that Arsenal mentality over a little bit more in the dressing room, which is good. You know, when you look at the, where Man City and Man and Liverpool are right now, we are we are streets away from that, uh, a long, long, long way away from it. We might have a good result here and there and nick into the, you know, people think, oh, right, we're back. We're not back. We've got a long way to go. But it's it's a, we're on an upward curve, hopefully. Okay, great, Lee. And just, just one more thing. You mentioned, I know the, the 89 film, obviously you was kind of a, a part of it and you've been doing punditry as well, but the, the 89 film, was you involved in some kind of producer side of it? Was you part of the organisation of it? Yeah, I was like an um, executive producer, whatever that means. So uh, there was Amy Lawrence, who's a big Arsenal fan. She was the exec producer as well and we... Uh, we kind of, she came to me with the idea and said, I said, I'm in. So my job was really to bring all the lads together, the players, get the interviews sorted out. And then uh, I was in on most of the interviews and, and kind of just pulling bits of stuff out when, and helping Amy out doing the interviews herself. And then we ended up with this incredible film and everybody who's, anybody who's not watched it should watch it. If, you, if you're not an Arsenal fan, mm. you should watch it because it's, it's a football film uh, with, a, with the best ending ever. And uh, I'm going to go and watch it now, Mitchell. I'm going to watch it again now. <laughs> and that, that role that you played in that film behind the scenes, is that something we might see more of Lee Dixon in the future, producing football-related content? Yeah, we've, we've got a couple of ideas that we've from the back of that 89 that we're going to do. I can't give you too much information, but watch this space. Is, we're working on something at the moment that's just been held up because of the, the pandemic. But... Um, it's sport related um, and there might be one or two more in the future so it's, it's fun it's a fun process and uh, yeah that's another another chapter in in, in my life so let's, let's, let's hope it's as successful as the last one 
Great. Well, I'll definitely keep an eye out for it. i um, excited to kind of see what you're going to be up to um, and what's coming back. And Lee, I just want to say um, thank you so much for coming on and giving your time and kind of reliving some of them. It meant so much to many, many Arsenal My fans pleasure. and probably many other football fans around as well. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Nice one, Lee. Thanks so much, man. You're a gentleman. Thanks so See much. Fella. Thank you, See mate. Fella. Bye. Thanks, mate. Uh, one nice guy, Lee Dixon. Um, could have spoke to him for, for, for hours, actually. You think you think some of the things he's, he's achieved in his career and, and some of the teams that he's been part of and, and kind of the difference in teams as well from the teams he came up with in his early part of his Arsenal career to the teams that he finished his career with. It's just a sign of a, of a true pro um, and somebody that just lived and breathed football. So thanks so much for joining us here on Elites TV. Um, if you haven't already, go and subscribe to our channel. You'll see there we don't just do Q&As. We've also got um, tournament football um, that we play our Coaches Cup. Uh, we've got roundtable discussions. We've got trailers. We've got kind of little skits of football content. Elites TV, go and follow us. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok now. Um, stay safe, stay well, and see you all soon.